Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this week's webinar from Annika Digital. It's myself and Stanley hosting today, and I'm um, very pleased to welcome Emil. Emil's doing his first um, webinar with us today, and he joined um, the social media team uh, just a few months ago, and he's already settled in, feels like he's one of the family, and he's a massive sports fan, and he's going to tell you all about that. So what I'm going to do uh, to start for the regulars will understand, I'm going to um, start with a couple of uh, with a poll. Um, and then from there, that will give you a, few, a bit more, a bit time. I can't get my words out. A bit of time for everybody to join us. Uh, and then um, I'll pass over to Emil to introduce himself properly. OK, so I'm going to start polling. And for the benefit of the video, I'm going to read out the questions and the answers. Um, you should be able to click on more than one of these. So what motivated you to join our webinar today? Um, I'm one of our uh, one of your regular webinar watchers. I try to attend and learn something new. Um, I know there's a few of you here that come quite often. I'm very interested in social media and wanted to see what I could apply to my business. I'm currently working in sports marketing and wanted to pick up a few tips. I'm interested in sports marketing and interested to know what it's all about. Other, I'm a big sports fan and also interested in marketing. Other, I try to attend as many webinars as possible to learn about any anything to do with marketing and then anything else. So at the moment, you it's a bit of a even spread. You've got about 40% that are um, actually interested in sports marketing and want to know what it's all about. Um, oh, actually, that's more like a third now. So we're, we're probably more of a, um, uh, an even split. So we've got about 20% are regular webinar watchers. 30% uh, are interested in social media and wanted to know what they can apply to the business. And about 30% are interested in sports marketing. There's only one person who's actually currently working in sports marketing. So that's really good because it means you can tell them lots of interesting stuff. So hopefully uh, that's all um, fine. Um, what I um, what we'll do is I'll pass over to Emil. Um, if you put um, any of your questions either in the Q&A or your chat, um, one of the team will start try and answer them or we'll go through those at the end. Um, and just for the people that aren't familiar, we will be sending out the recording later on. So um, good luck, Emil. Um, I'll see Thank you in you. about 50 minutes. Bye bye. Cool. Right. So let's crack on. Uh, just uh, going to talk to you briefly through what uh, I'll be talking about. Uh, introduce myself in a bit. Uh, I'll talk about the uniqueness of sport. So I've picked a handful of aspects that I think are quite uh, important to why sport is so appealing to such a mass market. Um, then I'll move into sports marketing, which links to the uniqueness. Uh, then I'll move on to social media, where I've got some great examples for you. And then uh, throughout, I'll give you a few uh, examples of how general businesses can apply uh, all the successful parts in sports marketing. Um, but then I'll go through them again at the end. And then if we have time, I'll just talk about some more boring and technical stuff that actually is really important uh, in terms of uh, Facebook. Uh, so a bit about me, uh, the picture here is a good uh, representation of me. Uh, I'm from Norway, so here I am playing football in the sun. Um, I'm a football addict, uh, which my mom will definitely agree with. She'll probably say that's an understatement. Um, I studied sports marketing at uni, which is uh, why I'm doing this presentation, because I'm applying my work experience with my uh, university experience. Uh, so combining them together, because now having worked in social media for a number of years now, I've kind of got a different critical eye when I analyze uh, different things. So yeah, that's why I want to share that with you. Now, I didn't actually um, create this slide, so I'm just going to read this one out where I see others. I'll expand a bit more. So uh, a bit about Annika. Um, we have a vast experience of working with companies that manufacture and produce their own products. Our deep understanding and focus on these specific sectors is what sets us apart from the competition, 
giving you comfort in knowing we are a true extension of your team. This is also why our international recognized clients stay with us year on year. So essentially, Annika, we've got a broad uh, variety of different clients. We have clients that are uh, quite serious, uh, what they their target market is serious. So we adapt accordingly to that. And then we have more uh, playful clients. So um, from my perspective on social media, for example, we have clients that are purely LinkedIn based, and then we have others that are more Instagram, where they're on Pinterest. So yeah, a bit more playful, but yeah, that's kind of what what we do at Annika. We can uh, we can adapt to the client. So moving on to the uniqueness of sport. So there are a lot of things that make sport so quite different to other industries and. Uh, I've picked out a handful of those because I can I can go on and on about different things. But uh, first of all, I want to talk about sports culture. So I'm going to use the US and Europe as comparison examples. Uh, now, one thing about sport is that consumer behavior varies between countries and cultures uh, and quite vastly as well, which uh, is quite unique. Now, when you look at... Uh, the US and Europe, the way I see it, especially on football, so soccer in the US, is that it's a little bit like uh, a hobby. Whereas when you look at the core fans in Europe, it's it's life. So it's hobby versus life. Like there's a, there's a lot more riding on sports. Um, in the US, it seems like uh, they don't mind sport as being a bit of casual entertainment. Uh, even if it's their own club. Now, that's in in Europe, we do that as well if you watch a neutral team. But if we're watching our own team, it's not casual. It's uh, very passionate. And uh, I think there are different elements that, uh, that make that. And one of those is that I think that European fans feel like you should be privileged to support their team. So... You don't just rock up when someone's won a trophy and you just start supporting them. You need to know about the team. You need to you need to know about the history. You need to know have knowledge in order to get that acceptance among fans. And that relates to things that I'll be talking about later on. Now, another example of how different it is in the US to Europe is, uh, for example, they call the LA Rams now. There used to be the St. Louis Rams, and before that, it was the LA Rams again, and then before that, it was St. Louis Rams. So this team has moved back and forth 1,589 miles, which is a – just imagine for a fan, like that's a, that's not a distance you can travel to go to games regularly. Uh, so uh, basically, I worked it out, and it's the equivalent of Manchester United moving to Moldova, uh, and that's something that's unimaginable at the top level in England now. Uh, there was Wimbledon who moved to Milton Keynes, uh, which was an absolute shambles for a start. Uh, and it's relatively comparable, uh, but it was only 50, only 50 miles for a start. But secondly, uh, there were financial reasons to it. They were on the brink of bankruptcy. But then also, obviously, they called MK Donson or Wimbledon. All the assets were returned to Merton. So the trophies or the trademarks, that's been moved back to the borough, the original borough. So there's not really any connection at all there. And what also happened was that they put in place stricter regulations on relocation. So that sort of thing couldn't happen in the future. Um, now, just because there, there are differences, it doesn't mean that everything's negative about the American game. But uh, so there are certain things that, that European clubs can apply. So say, for example, if I go to... I'm an Arsenal fan, so I'll be mentioning Arsenal a lot. When I go to an Arsenal game, what I what I do is usually meet up with a friend in a pub before, then we go to the game, and then we go to the pub after. But there's no... We have to go to the pub to do that. You can have a drink inside the stadium, but it's not particularly uh, set up for a nice experience. And after the game, it's almost impossible to actually... Uh, actually hang out with your friends and talk about the game in a nice environment that uh, 
is where it's arranged by the club. Uh, if you go to a cup final, for example, at Wembley, when I go there, they do have that kind of setup. So they've started to learn it in that way. Um, uh, there's also like a rush in, rush out mindset that uh, people are really trying to eliminate from the game. So people are rushing out the stadium. People will watch a nil-nil game up until the 88th minute and then they'll leave. And then the game can finish 1-0 or 2-0. So they've missed the best part of the game. No, no one likes a last minute winner more than uh, that's the best feeling in the world. And then they've just wasted 88 minutes of boring football and then left. Like it's a it's something I've never understood. But if you have a sort of post-game atmosphere that you have in the US and that match experience, part of it, that that can work really well. Plus, it's another revenue stream. So I'm not sure why they haven't capitalized on that as much as they should. But yeah, you obviously need to consider the fans because the core of football fans, they don't want football to be compared to going to the cinema. So just relax and watch the game. They want the passion. You want, when you go to a game, you want passionate fans. You want people singing. You want people cheering on. Uh, so it's very important. So this image here is very important to consider when you make changes to the European game. It's that it's a working class game and it shouldn't be for the 1%. So uh, very important to consider that. Now, when we talked about moving teams uh, and what would happen in Europe, I think the European Super League is a... Uh, I can see a lot of... Uh, I can see a lot of American uh, ways in the European Super League uh, in the way that that was done. Uh, they Americanized the format, which is something that's frowned upon in Europe, where people, if you finish bottom, you don't get relegated, you just stay there. And you don't, have, you don't win by merit, which is something that it became very clear that is extremely important for fans. Um, I don't think fans were considered uh, at all. When they set it up, there wasn't enough research done. And uh, a lot of the owners were American as well, which definitely makes me think that uh, it was a step towards Americanizing the game. Now, another massive mistake that they did was that they labeled leg uh, traditional fans as legacy fans. So basically, they said that they want to focus on the younger fans and they made up uh, some... Uh, some quite ridiculous stats where they basically said that young people don't care about sport anymore and they don't they have the intention attention span of a goldfish so they were considering reducing the time and everything but the way i consider this is like the, if you're a season ticket holder uh, so you're a legacy fan uh you spend two thousand pounds plus on a season ticket traveling to games memorabilia food when you go uh and you do that for 20 years that's a lot of money and then you get called irrelevant. That's how I looked at it. And if you're a normal business, that's something you would never do. If you have a customer that <laughs> that subscribes to your product uh, on a weekly basis, they pay and they've been doing it for 20 years, they've been giving you a ridiculous amount of money, you would not, you would not go out in the media and call them uh, irrelevant because you just want new customers. Um, uh, but some businesses, do make that mistake to a point, uh, for example, by giving benefits to new customers and not old ones. But uh, yeah, something to learn there. Um, one thing to consider as well about um, sport is that uh, a football fan, for example, they can't just switch to another brand. You don't just switch, oh, no, I had a bad service from Arsenal, I'm going to switch to Tottenham. That's not something that fans can do. Whereas if you have a bad experience at McDonald's, then you can move to Burger King. It's not a massive move. If you have a clothing brand, uh, that if, say you experience low quality from a piece of clothing that you bought, you can switch brand. It's quite an easy move. You can't do that in sport. And that is something that is uh, extremely precious in the industry. So I, were they complacent? Probably. They probably took their legacy fans for granted. So what happened was obviously this. Uh, from uh, a number of the big clubs. So it was also a spark, especially for the likes of Arsenal and, um, and Manchester United. There's been, there's been a lot of animosity towards the owners anyway. So it was just like the final straw for them where no matter what these mass process. And obviously people have been locked in for a year, so they needed something to do. 
So moving on to history and connection. So fans in fans in football, they obsess over history. I liken it a little bit to a child's obsession with dinosaurs. So when you're about when you're five years old, if you ask a child, they'll name you every dinosaur when they live, what they eat, and yeah, it's ridiculous the amount of knowledge a young child will have about about dinosaurs. But then they kind of move away from that. But in football, uh, that stays with you. So you have uh, me, for example. I know the I know the ages of uh, twenty four players. I know I know the history. I've researched it, and I've uh, from way, way before I was born as well. So it's something that we kind of obsess about, which I think is quite unique. I mean, okay, fair enough. A business can talk about when they were founded, but that's more to talk about their experience. We've been doing this for this long, but no one's going. The history isn't relevant in that same way. Um, because history is so important, it means that modernization is seen as a bit of a threat. So... Uh, recruiting young fans is very important in, in sports because if you recruit a young fan, then you have them for the rest of their lives. Because, like I mentioned before, they don't switch. That's not something, well, in general, you do have some, but I don't think you can count them as core fans. Um, but uh, modernization can, it is appealing for younger fans. So, I've used this here uh, as an example, this image, because when I was a young child, this was actually my screensaver on my computer. I think I was about, I was probably about uh, 13 or something. And uh, I was, I saw this and I thought, first of all, it's a pretty clever caption. I thought, yeah, that's awesome. I probably didn't even know what revolution meant though, but uh, I just thought that badge, yeah, that's nice and nice and modern and slick. But then, as I matured and I grew up and I became a bit wiser, I started to dislike it more and more because I started to get a better understa understanding of the history. And I started to think this is more like a, a McDonald's version of uh, of the badge. And uh, then I, when I was at uni, I actually studied this. I did coursework on, on the change of badge. And uh, what I found was that there was, uh, there was a, clear lack of consultation with the with the fans so they didn't actually understand what the fans wanted and i didn't they didn't consider things like historical elements and how important they are and uh how you have like the borough's crest there and it, it just it was simplified too much now the move the move from the badge was not just because they wanted to do it it was because of copyright reasons but there were several things that they could have done a lot better in order to make it tick both boxes instead of just the copyright um, marketing box. Um, now that differs from uh, normal businesses when it comes to logos, because if you don't update your logo on a regular basis, then your logo will look outdated and it will affect performance because people won't think you're up to date in the business, in the industry. So uh, in, in Europe, I think that fans, they have a primeval, connection to the club. So it runs through generations in families and they feel like it's part of their DNA. I mean, if you look at this image here, I think uh, you, you'll struggle to find that for a general business. So like, I, I don't think you'd see anyone with Tesco on their back with the, the year Tesco was founded because no one cares when they were founded and then the historical logo. But one thing to note here as well is that uh, these tattoos are do not feature the new badge because this features a badge from 1930. So that's a, the Art Deco badge that was briefly introduced by Herbert Chapman. So you, there you see, this is just history that, I, that I've uh, studied throughout my life. So it's an Art Deco badge and it's an old badge and it's a badge that people really like because of the history. But yeah, again, it's quite unique for someone to have such a connection that they'll, they'll do something like that. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily ever do anything like this, but I would consider having a small tattoo with Arsenal, for example. Um, and then there's also the fact that people connect people to the clubs that they support. So uh, in terms of people who actually see the club that you support as a personal trait. So if someone talks about uh, a friend, for example, and they talk about football, they'll say, oh, yeah, he's a gooner. That's, that's part of their personality almost when they describe a person. 
Um, and uh, fans also get effect- their moods get affected by games. So if a team loses, someone will be genuine, genuinely down. And if a team's doing really bad, people get depressed. And uh, the other, the flip side of that is the euphoria of winning. Uh, and then just like a piece of advice uh, for everyone that it's just a game is probably the worst thing you can say after a loss. Um, and then we have the connection to community and geography. Uh, people are proud to be associated with their city and part of the city. Uh, I mean, that's enforced by the love of local rivalries. You can see how much that means to fans. And then we have loyalty and proud. So like I mentioned early on, if you recruit a fan, you have a loyal customer, which is something that you shouldn't use in sport because they shouldn't be seen as customers um, for life. Um, A core fan will follow the team if they get relegated for four seasons in a row. But a clothing brand, say say there was an exclusive brand uh, sold for £500 uh, in Harrods, if that kind of starts to die out and then it ends up in Primark or Sports Direct for a fiver, you're not the, the same people aren't going to be buying it um, because there's, you don't have that deep connection to the brand. Uh, you also look at loyalty despite adversity. That's kind of seen as mental toughness. I mean, uh, there are children that are bullied throughout their whole school life because of the team they support, because everyone, everyone supported uh, Man United in the night is because they won the treble whereas your team their team wasn't winning something but then you grow up and it's something that they take pride in that they stay loyal and they they really they really do support that team it's not because of uh, winning trophies and then we have a, a different aspect here and this is this is absolutely key and that's the unpredictability of outcome um any team can win on their day and no two matches are the same so when you go to a game, even if it's a nil-nil and another nil-nil, they, they're completely different games. You don't know what's going to happen. And that's the fact that any team can win on their day is something that keeps on fueling the interest. You never know what's going to happen. There's, there's always, always a chance. Um, and you look at Leicester, when they won the league, uh, if you know football enough, it's, it would have been a ridiculous bet to put on. It was 5,000 to 1. It would have been stupid. Uh, people would have told you you're better off uh, throwing money out the window because it was that unlikely. But then they managed it. And it, it's, it's, something, it's something that is so appealing to sport that people don't know what's going to happen next. So now I'll move on to the marketing side of things. Now I'll introduce sport and a few unique aspects because they are really key to the marketing side of things because they're, they're the things that you need to take advantage of. Uh, and they should shape the strategy in sport marketing. So sports clubs and brands, they're privileged to have an audience that is blindly loyal. So they need to nourish it instead of abusing it. So the Super League, I feel like that was uh, abuse of it because uh, they just expected the loyal fans to stay loyal no matter what. Uh, And they might keep supporting their team, but... uh, they're sure as hell not going to start uh, spend money if you start abusing them. Um, you need to use marketing to grow that pride because the prouder a fan is, the more he will find ways he or she will find ways to show it. So if if they feel appreciated, they'll they'll attend more games, they'll purchase more memorabilia, they'll talk about it, they'll they'll spread the word of mouth, they'll make more people. Uh, younger fans want to be part of it. So I've got a really good example here of uh, great PR from uh, Bayern Munich. So there was uh, they were asked about their season, t- their cheapest season ticket being only £104, uh, which is a lot lower than in England. Um, so the answer was, uh, well, let's say we charged £300, we'd get £2 million more in income, but what's £2 million to us? In a transfer discussion, you argue about that sum for five minutes. And that is uh, such a genuinely, it's an honest answer. And it, it's uh, its such a true thing as well, Where, whereas that means a lot to a fan. That's a big increase, £200, especially to a working class fan. Uh, it's relatively not much to buy Munich at all. And then they probably earn that back because people are so so much prouder because of because the club went out and said that and now the whole world knows 
and uh, younger fans can look at that and think actually they have they've actually got values so i'm going to move on to a subject that is uh, quite big in in sports marketing so talk about sponsorship first so sponsor it's a related to sponsorship uh, mainly um so sponsorship in sport basically uh there are official sponsors that allow um, businesses to use uh to use different events or teams in their adverts uh i've got a little fun fact here from norway uh, about the olympic ring so they were actually owned by a a norwegian brewery called friedenlund and uh, it was uh, then sold on to Ringness because it makes more sense because as I the ring is actually in the name of the brewery. Uh, so that actually belonged to the brand and um, the Olympic Committee actually had to hire the rights, so pay for the rights to use the rings up until 1972 when it was sold for one penny, but on one condition that they could keep on using it. So here's a new can of the root beer. Now, ambush marketing, uh, it's kind of a way of hijacking and uh, trying to get around the regulations of sponsorship. So businesses are really clever in the way that they that they try to get around because it costs a hell of a lot of money to get these official sponsorship deals. So they have to come up with creative strategies and it doesn't necessarily, this applies to all companies, how you can, how, I mean, I'm not encouraging it because it's kind of, it's, it's a little bit borderline. Uh, because you're trying to find loopholes. But um, we've got a great example here from World Cup 2010. So it's a well-known fact that uh, that people, uh, that cameramen at events, they are, they, they've got two jobs, and that's to follow the ball around. And then also it seems like they just have to find attractive women in the crowd. And uh, Bavaria, uh, which is a beer brand in Holland, they knew this very well. Uh, so what they did was they managed to source tickets uh, to a game, uh, Holland versus Denmark. Versus Denmark. Uh, everyone knows, everyone who's seen Holland at a tournament know that they wear all orange. So they were dressed all in orange. But uh, so they managed to get about they managed to get thirty six seats close to each other, and then magic, magic, the cameramen spotted them and kept on going in. Uh, so they got some attention there. People started asking a few questions, but it wasn't a major splash. Uh, but then what happens is that uh, they manage, uh, FIFA managed to spot them, so they kicked them out. Now, obviously, there's a big hole there where all they was, uh, where they were all standing, and by making that big splash, all of a sudden there's mass PR. So they kind of shot themselves in the foot there because. Uh, Whereas if a couple of people would have been talking about it before, all of a sudden everyone was talking about it. Um, now, ambush marketing can be so successful and big brands are doing it. And a good example is uh, during the Brazil 2014 World Cup, 38% of people uh, in a survey thought MasterCard was an official sponsor, but it was in fact uh, Visa. So that just shows 38% is a massive percentage. Another brand that is very good at it is Nike. So I don't know if you remember this advert here, but they essentially what Nike did was that they they try they do it every time, and they they're very good at it. Um, and they also a third actually think that Nike are an official sponsor. So, but what they do in their ads is that they kind of uh, they give themselves ammunition by using certain elements. So in this photo here on the right, we've got Slatan Ibrahimovic. Who plays for Sweden? Sweden didn't qualify, and uh, he's also in his uh, in his uh, PSG kit, which uh, isn't a national team, uh, obviously. Uh, at the front, you've got Iniesta, who plays for Spain, sponsored by Adidas, but he's in his Barcelona kit. So it's all everyone's in Nike kits. Some aren't even part of it. Uh, so then they have ammunition to argue against the fact that we aren't actually trying to do it. We're just here. We just so happen to be in uh, in Rio de Janeiro, which is the country in the country hosting it, and we've just got some of our sponsored players. Uh, and the rules get tighter and tighter. 
So it gets more and more difficult. But yeah, again, I think it's a, it is clever and it does seem to work very well. Now, ambush marketing can be applied um, in other businesses as well. I think this is a great example of uh, how it can be done. So here we have an iPad, iPod uh, advert with the different colors and then uh, a painting band called Rona has kind of ambushed or hijacked this. So they've added a banner with their paint buckets underneath. I think that's a brilliant use of, uh, of what I'd call ambush marketing as well. And what you can do in because of social media in this day and age is that you can set this up and then you can spark, you can spark that, um, that viral content by actually publishing yourself because, uh, Sometimes the audience will do it because they think it's clever. Other times you just need to give that spark. So let's talk about social media and sport. A great thing about social media is that you, is that you have increased flexibility. So I mentioned before that sport affects moods and uh, you can be in a great state of euphoria after a last minute winner. And you can be in a, you can be in a terrible mood, and you can have uh, temporary negative feelings towards the team because you've been embarrassed or you're unhappy. Maybe things in general aren't going well, and then there's another thing, bad thing that happens. And uh, uh, what happens then is that uh, you kind of start to have a negative feeling towards people talking about uh, talking about the brand. So this is a real life experience for me. So. Uh, Arsenal, we've had a pretty shocking season so far. Uh, well, so far. I mean, this last year was a shocking season. Um, and uh, we had a really bad game. I can't remember against who, but then I went on social media and Lavazza, which is uh, an official sponsor of Arsenal, they had an ad there. And I just thought, I can't be dealing with this. I don't want to see this. Uh, and I went to the comments and uh, everyone was saying the same. They were telling them, it was saying, telling them to piss off. And uh, it just made me think that uh, if you are in the industry and you are on social media, you need to use that reactive uh, and flexible side of things. Because if I, if uh, Lavazza had paused that ads for a few days to let the fans calm down, then I think it would have performed a lot better. They wouldn't have that negative connotation. People, a bad game, Instantly, you have a negative feeling, but then you calm down again. So that pulse restart approach needs to be used on social media if if you're a sports brand. Uh, see, even to a degree that sports clubs, I don't really, I don't really want to see Arsenal post a, a, fi a final score post or every time the opposition team, uh, every time the opposition team scores. Uh, I'd, sometimes I see clubs do it quite well. They'll. They've got a nice banner every time the team scores and then when the other team scores, they just do a quick text tweet. And I think, yeah, I like that. Minimal effort for what I see as a negative uh, thing that's just happened. Um, so yeah, you need to utilize that flexibility that allows you to be reactive. Um, but then on the flip side to the negative side is that people are in that, can be in that euphoric state of mind and uh, brands can take advantage of that because you can actually form a positive association for life. So let's take uh, the England penalty shootout at uh, the last tournament uh, against Colombia. I'd say every English person will remember exactly where they were at that time. And because of that, they'll have a positive connection to that place. So if other brands can actually come in and uh, take advantage of it, then then they'll be able to form that connection as well. Uh, and then there's another positive as well about being a smaller brand in when it comes to having the reactive approach, and that is there's less red tape. Uh, if you're a big brand like Nike or Adidas, you probably have to go through three, four stages before something gets approved and can go out. Whereas if you're a smaller company, you've got more flexibility and less red tape. So you can be more reactive in that way and take advantage of, of what's happening there and then. Uh, now, in terms of the equivalent of what it's called, it's kind of like news hacking, news hijacking. It's, it's 
along those lines. And then we've got the segmented approach because uh, with sport and uh, general uh, business, uh, that you can have a segmented approach because you're you're able to target people on such a precise level. So you can preach to your audience at the right time with the right messages. Uh, and that catered approach really needs to be applied. Uh, so in terms of talking to people, you need to you need to design your content so you can so you target people specifically on what will appeal to them. So if I use uh, sports club, for example, they, they'll have fans abroad and they'll have local fans that live in the local area. Now, the news that appeals to the fans abroad might be quite different to what appeals to the local fans. So if you're doing, uh, say, for example, someone has sponsored uh, a, a local charity in the community, someone living abroad, might they've probably never heard of this charity for a start. And they, even though it's not going to cause any damage if they know about that happening, I feel like uh, if you put budget behind it, it's a bit of a waste doing it. Uh, on a whole approach, you should you should segment that and uh, spend that wisely and uh, use the power of social media where you can be targeted. Uh, and likewise goes when it comes to the foreign fans and talking about the journey of traveling in because uh, fans who live abroad, they spend a lot of money traveling over and it's a whole journey and a whole different experience. But when it comes to the local fans, they might have some negative kind of neg negative feelings towards the foreign fans because they, they might think that's a little bit like promoting tourist fans. So again, segment it so so that the right messaging goes to the right people. Um, so now I want to show you a few examples of uh, ads that have been really successful in uh, using these using the aforementioned. So we've got Adidas kit launches. I've got a few clips here. Uh, I'm not going to play the whole ones because that would just bore you to sit for three minutes, but I'll play, I'll play a few seconds of each. So here we got one of the kit launches. So that's the first one. I'm going to explain why these are so brilliant in a second. Got another one here that I absolutely loved. Yeah, so those two ads, I'll talk about them in a second uh, and why they're so good. So I also have another one here in stills, which I also think did really well. So I'll talk about this one first, why I think uh, the launch for this. They did a similar video to the ones before for this launch. So it, essentially my my user journey to this was that I first, I saw the kit as it is and I thought it looked like... Uh, something that Dexter might have worn whilst he was uh, killing one of his victims. Uh, didn't think it was particularly attractive. I thought extremely random. Uh, didn't appeal to me at all. But then they launched this video and kind of uh, talked about the history. And uh, turns out they was inspired by the marble halls in the East End of Highbury. So I thought, okay, well, I actually quite like that. And then the video really was really engaging and it went through the marble halls and then you had different elements where you see uh, here's, here you got 
Kieran Tierney, who's one of the players from Scotland, and they've added in social elements. So they've been listening to social media about things that went viral. So, for example, the plastic bag here. Basically, what happened was that Kieran Tierney was pictured walking into a game with his kit in a Tesco bag, and it went viral uh, on Twitter especially uh, because everyone just loved the fact that he's such a normal guy and he's uh, and he yeah basically instead of bringing a Gucci bag he just had a Tesco bag and it was brilliant so what's good about that is that first of all they brought in the history hi the history part and explained why the kit was designed like that and then they brought in viral things they've been listening now the other videos one of the things that they brought in that's brilliant on them for those two videos was the history part uh, and the nostalgia. Uh, you know, there were they've been listening to people because uh, especially the the Bruce Banana kit is what it's called, the yellow one. That's a kit that's been talked about a lot, and uh, fans. It's it's kind of like it's so ugly that people think it's cool, and they've obviously taken notice of that and. Uh, and they've taken notice of how retro kits have become more and more popular, which also relates to the fact that uh, the badge was over-modernised, so people like the retro kits even more among Arsenal fans. Uh, there's also pop culture. They've, they've included pop culture aspects. So they've got uh, up-and-coming hip-hop artists in there. I think in their first video that I showed, there's a kind of like a Stranger Things vibe, to it where they've got that yeah they've got i feel like they've really nailed that part of things because they've they've listened again and stranger things was obviously a massive hit that was a it became a lot more popular than people probably would have predicted and they've noticed how what effect that had um they've also used social media personalities now and they've combined it with uh legends from the club so here you got david seaman who doesn't love that smile uh, next to him, you can't actually see it, but next to him is a YouTuber called Chunks. So they're completely different personalities, but they've been combined together to give that broader appeal. Uh, and then probably the most important thing that they've done are the social media optimizations. So the yellow video, that is pretty much the perfect example of a social media video because they give no time for people to switch focus because they keep on re-grabbing people's attention. If you watch it again after, you'll notice how every few seconds they just keep on bringing in a new element because what happens in this day and age is that people don't have time. You don't have time to build it up before you, before you go in for the punch. You need to do it straight away. So it, it took, for the yellow video, I think it took one second of less than a second to understand that the, what the ad was actually about. And then it just kept on re-engaging. And then here we have another one, uh, which I think is really good. Uh, and that's this is for Nike. My longest day, man. You said you were gonna come to me, now you're telling me to come to you. I'm not getting on a sassy. Sassy? That's light work. Man's got around two miles from end, just to get the train in. Jeez, bro. Two miles? Really? I'll play that a little bit longer because uh, basically what I wanted to show you is that kind of build up where it's like uh, it just keeps on building on the next one it keeps on trying to better the next which is a great way of engaging people uh, but that ad that was specifically designed to appeal to Londoners. And uh, when that ad came out, I'd lived in London for about seven years. So 
to me, I just thought it was absolutely brilliant because it was a it was a completely different way of advertising to a Londoner. Where whereas usually people advertise and uh, London is such a glamorous, like made in Chelsea, Instagram filtered place where everything's amazing. But the fact is that that is not the real London. Whereas this ad actually shows a lot of the real London. So you get that emotional connection with Londoners and local people. So they use that geographical. Uh, geographical uh connection so yeah you got the real struggles there's no hollywood uh there's no the american dream it's everyday struggles where people will connect with it because all of these people talk about a different struggle with their sport and yeah it's absolutely fantastic um there's also a lot of inclusion in there i didn't go far enough but oh, it starts off with people living in the sort of like the Peckham area. Uh, but then it also includes, um, if you go further in, there's a rower, for example, who talks about, oh, yeah, my family uh, my family thinks I'm a failure if I don't finish top. So they've included a completely different demographic in there and tried to include as many different people as possible. Then they've also got uh, pop culture. Uh, in the picture in the background here, you've got Skepta there who... Is a grime artist. Grime was massive at the time, and it's still it's still uh, a very trendy genre. Uh, you've got viral comedians, so Michael Deepers in it at the time. He was absolutely blowing up. That's the guy who does uh, uh, what's this? Man's not hot. So they've incorporated all these elements into a fantastic video that appeals massively to Londoners. Now. There are definitely challenges when it comes to social media as well. And one of them is that um, it's a negative negativity because social media gives everyone a voice. Um, unfortunately, that includes idiots. And uh, there are, there seems to be a lot of them out there. Um, over time, it feels like negativity has increased. Uh, I mean, racism, it's obviously coming more to surface now as people are more comfortable calling people out. Uh, but I feel like even that has grown because people are becoming braver. Uh, they hide behind their screens. So here on the right, we've got uh, uh, we've got one example of uh, messages uh, that were posted to Martial, and uh, that was called out. And then we have uh, another newspaper article where they boycotted social media quite recently because they want to counter them. Um, there's also there's a challenge for individual sports stars because if you can imagine getting getting all this abuse you start to think uh thus do the positives of the marketing side and being able to connect with the uh, nice fans uh are they outweighed by all the negatives of getting abused all the time uh, but the thing is uh, when it comes to a business posting and the negativity is that you need to have a mindset that you'll never please everyone uh, because everyone has a voice and a reach is absolutely brilliant on when you advertise on social media, especially the reach is huge. So you will reach people that uh, are going to give a negative comment. If you've ever been on mail online, you'll never find one comment that doesn't have at least one thumbs down. And that just like solid solidifies the fact that there's always going to be some, doesn't matter how positive the story is. So say for example, a sports star talks about how we made a charity donation. What you'll see is, Oh, why didn't you give more? Or uh, why are you bragging about it? You should do it. Uh, you should do it quietly and be modest. So it's, uh, that's just how people have started to twist it. But then you just need to have the mindset that you're not going to be able to please everyone. Uh, you got the microscopic attention as well. So sports stars are 24 ambassadors for clubs and brands. So in a social media age, everything is scrutinized. Uh, so that's a real challenge to influencer activity on social media. So uh, in the past, there has been a challenge when it comes to appealing to, um, when, when it comes to picking different ambassadors, it's been a challenge in the past because the people can have scandals uh, and it's in the media. But now the threat level has risen even more. Uh, so what companies uh, and uh, people have started to do, they they hire management companies. But then what happens is that, first of all, the personal connection that was really appealing with social media disappears. And, all, and then also uh, 
they they make mistakes. Uh, so here, for example, we have Joe Hart, his media team posted uh, job done after they got knocked out of a game because he thought that uh, Tottenham had won 3-0, but they actually lost 3-0. Uh, then you got security challenges because uh, logins and whatnot. Uh, another example uh, from uh, Tottenham where Dulux became a new partner, but then I think what happened was that either they got hacked or an old employee had access to their social media account. So they started to make fun of the club through uh, <laughs> through the social media account, and that went absolutely viral. Uh, but then you've got the power of social media as well. That, and uh, there are a couple of examples here of how brilliant it can be. So Raheem Sterling, he was abused by newspapers for years and years, and it was... Uh, borderline racist attacks where they kind of, because it seemed like if a white player was doing the same, it was absolutely fine. But then what happened on social media was that everyone started to take notice and there was a huge push to call out all these newspapers. And uh, in the end, they managed to stop a lot of it. Uh, then you got Marcus Rashford. Uh, he met with uh, Barack Obama the other day after his activity and social media is definitely part of that. So I've gone through a few uh, examples of how you can apply it. Uh, now, forming an emotional connection, just because you don't have the same uh, the same attributes as in sport, you can still do that because there are many things that people are really passionate about. And I think uh, a recent advert from uh, the campaign that Carlsberg are currently doing uh, when, they, when they're appealing... Uh, to people that are against plastic pollution, which should be pretty much everyone in the world. I think that's really, that's been a really good way of forming an emotional connection where people, I remember we watched that advert the other day and my girlfriend said, I think you should be buying Cosberg now then. So again, it's a, it's a clever way of kind of forming an emotional connection there where by showing that you're caring. Uh, and then also, it's important to take notice of these big brands because they have massive budgets. They're, they're able to do market research and do things on a, on a way bigger scale. So you need to take notice of that and uh, uh, learn from what they're doing. So when you look at that Adidas video that I showed you, that best the best practice used there in the, in the video about how they keep on adding new elements and keep on bringing in interesting things for the target market you can use that as well in your industry. You just need to adapt it accordingly. Um, and then it comes to, uh, when it comes to the ambush marketing, uh, it's uh, it's useful to take notes of how non-sponsors are using their crea creativity to steal the thunder, because you can do that to compete with the big dogs and see how can you, like, what can we apply to our industry in order to, capture that attention and perhaps make people bring us to the forefront of their minds as opposed to one of the bigger companies. And then it's also extremely important to use social media as a listening tool, just like Arsenal did with the viral celeb uh, celebs and events such as the plastic bag and listening to what is being talked about. Uh, such as what kits are being talked about and then making decisions on what to sell in that in that way. Now, we run out of time, which is absolutely on time. This is just about domain uh, verification and uh, aggregated events, which is something you need to do on Facebook now. You're, you're fine, you're fine, Emil. You've got another five minutes, so... Um, okay, cool. Five minutes. So you can, yeah, so, it would be yeah. nice to explain these in quite a lot of detail because a lot of people who have got Facebook ads would need to understand this. Yeah, so this this has nothing to do with sports marketing and social and uh, yeah, sports marketing and social media. This is just about your Facebook accounts on their own. Basically, there's been a lot of uh, privacy uh, changes recently, uh, and uh, what it's led to is that attributing uh, different events. Uh, that are happening and conversions that are happening uh, on your social media ads, you've lost that. So we work, we've started to work a little bit more blindly. Uh, but Facebook, they're trying to counter that as best as possible in order to recapture that data. So what they are telling everyone to do, and everyone has to do this uh, if you're running social media ads, it's not uh, an optional. You just have to do it or else you're going to start to 
work completely blindly. And that's, first of all, you need to verify your domain on Facebook. So you can do that in business settings on the brand safety. And then uh, you've got three options there on how to do it. You can send that to your developers because it's probably going to be foreign language to the average person. Uh, once that's been verified, uh, everyone's got events through their pixels, or they should do through uh, when they're running ads. Uh, basically, aggregated events, you can add eight of these, and you then add them um, in terms of priority. So if you're an e-commerce business, then purchase is obviously going to be your priority. But then you might want to add a few other other events that you can uh, then use, say, for example, add to cart. It's quite important if you want to run an uh, abandoned cart campaign or, yeah, something like that. But, yeah, there's, uh, we've got more information on that. I'm just going to copy a this link I've got there into the chat so you can, you can read a bit more. But, yeah, it's something that it's an absolute must do. Yeah, I mean, some of our clients, we've noticed suddenly they're, for some of them, the conversions have dropped quite significantly because they haven't got this set, set up properly. But I think you were saying for other clients, it's not been as much of a problem. Yeah, it depends on the client and it depends on how the customer, the consumer behavior is in that industry as well, because they've, they've shortened the window from 28 day clicks to seven day clicks. So if you have a market that needs to be warmed a little bit more, and they take a bit longer to actually make that decision to purchase, then you've lost a lot of data. Whereas if you're in an industry where people tend to click the ad and buy it straight away, then you probably lost a little bit less because you still have it, but you still need to do this to get maximum data. And, and basically, if anybody has is having problems with their Facebook tracking, and I did read yesterday that um, Android are going to do the same. So it's not going to be just an Apple issue. It's going to be an Android issue as well. Um, then we can um, we can definitely help them uh, uh, if they you know if they need some pay assistance with that. We can. Um, I'm not sure how long it would take, but there's definitely some assistance, some extra consultancy on that. Um, excellent. I think um, Tom's been asking lots, answering a lot of questions in the chat while you've been talking, Emil. Um, I was really, I thought, I, apart from the fact that you're an Arsenal supporter, which, you know, we've got a lot of Leicester supporters here. Um, uh, I thought what was most interesting was the fact that uh, the, the examples can really be applied to lots of businesses. And there's been a massive, um, this sort of news hacking, ha hacking or news hijacking approach has been really, really popular um, in the last, in the, you know, in the, particularly in the last year. Um, I know that there was, um, you know, Ikea have done it and um, there was all the stuff with the um, the Caterpillar for uh, um, Aldi and Marks and Sparks where it just it just became a big thing and just other people were jumping on the bandwagon. So there's some really interesting stuff that's been going out there. So thanks. Thanks very much. It was a fascinating. I was listening in the background. It's a fascinating talk and uh, well done for your first presentation. Um, so I got a couple of things to do before the end. Um, so just to let you all know that you can still grab the slides from the handouts um, top right. And also um, the video will be available later on. Um, next week, we've got a guide to Spotify and advertising. Um, and that's on next Friday on the 11th. And that's um, Arena Holiday, um, who actually, I think, joined the same day as you, Emil, if I remember correctly. Um, and she's part of the paid media team. Um, and this is really interesting because we're actually planning to run some Spotify advertising ourselves. Um, so arena has got uh, an incredible, um, oh, I think, 15 years experience in paid media, both in paid search and paid social. Um, and she's decided to do something completely different. So if any of you are interested, you'll get an email to join that. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to mention for anybody that's um, in, in – interested in increasing their qualifications. Um, we have got the um, DMI course. The next one starts in July. So if any of you are um, basically, this is anywhere between a thousand and three thousand pounds, depending on whether you watch the, the live stream or you attend the um, webinars in person. So um, if you are interested, um, we can contact you and give you a little bit more information but that's due to start 
um, on the 14th of July. Excellent. Well, that's just perfect timing. Um, I'll send the video out later on, but thanks very much, Emil. And uh, we'll see you all next week. Sorry, sorry, Emil, what did you say? Uh, just thank you all for listening. Excellent. So thanks, guys. Um, we'll see you all next week. Bye-bye.